Let's all stand as we sing. I sing the mighty Like glory's known. There's not a plant or flower below but makes thy glory's known, and clouds arise and tempest flow by order from thy throne. While all that borrows life from thee is ever in my care, and everywhere. seated. Junior Church, you are dismissed. If you want to go out through the double doors, Pastor Andrew and Heather are going to be running that tonight. And uh, just want to remind you, if you do want to give a, a love offering to Brother Snavely, anything that comes in on that, there should be a like a brown a wooden a little offering plate on that back uh, main table. Um, anything that goes into there will go directly toward him and his ministry. Um, and also, the book table, uh, this will be your last chance to get at some of those, so if you want to see something, uh, grab something, uh, please feel free to do that. And unfortunately, this is our last night with Brother Snavely. It's really been great to have you, brother. Thank you so much for coming, and Lord bless you. Why don't we just have a word of prayer? We'll get started. Father, thank you so much for the joy of being together. Lord, it's been a blessing. I know many of us have been privileged to be able to be out here each night and to be able to um, hear uh, different things about your creation. We pray, Lord, that it would cause us to praise you all the more and cause us to um, have other things that we can share with people who may be skeptical to your hand upon creation. Lord, we know it's been slandered in our land and in our really our civilization for about 150 years now. And so we just pray that you will um, open the minds of not only our uh, our hearts, but help us, uh, Lord, as we live in a society that really needs to desperately understand that they uh, they have a creator and they will give an account to him. And so may we be faithful to share that truth with people around us. Bless Brother Snavely as he comes to speak in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening one last time. <laughs> and thank you for bearing with me. While I go, go through this little situation I'm in, uh, two things I wanted to um, mention to you before we, uh, before we start, and that is thank you so much for your hospitality this week, especially those of you who have um, put goodies in our hotel room and provided that for us and provided meals for us and everything. Thank you so much for everything. And there was a wonderful meal here on Sunday and everything. Thank you so much for your hospitality. We've really enjoyed being with you folks again. It's been a year and a half. And I think it was only Sunday that we heard last year, I think. Just one day. I think we did sessions all day or four sessions. I don't know what we did, but uh, just basically here one day. So thank you so much again. Secondly, <clears throat> um, if you're interested in anything... If you wouldn't mind going to the table right afterwards, because they're probably going to, it takes a little while to kind of take everything down and so forth. If you're interested in anything, if you wouldn't mind going right there, because I think uh, my wife is going to start taking the things down uh, like 10 minutes after we're finished with this. So if you're interested in anything there, please go directly there. That way, that way we, you can wrap that up. So tonight we're going to do a, a session that normally is, well, we're doing it this week, it kind of wraps up the sessions. Um, this is, it, 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 to me, a fascinating topic because it does compare um, the evolution model, kind of it's sort of a final comparison of the evolution model with what the Bible teaches. And uh, interestingly, there have been many 
artifacts discovered over the last number of years that have been labeled oop art, O-O-P-A-R-T, oop art. Now, it's not some sort of pop art anything, not some sort of pop culture thing. It stands for out-of-place artifacts. Out-of-place artifacts. Why are they considered out-of-place? They're considered out of place because it doesn't quite fit the theory. If you were here on Sunday, we talked, or maybe Monday night, I forget which, when I mentioned, the, the, uh, the unconformity, the great unconformity in the Grand Canyon where there's no fossils at all and suddenly there's very complex fossils and they just can't understand where the missing, they, they, they claim there's missing layers there somehow of missing billion and a half years of, of, of evolution. No, it's not missing, it's just evidence of a flood thing. And so it's the same thing here. They're, they, they are trying to make a jump from ape-like creatures that they claim we used to be two to four million years ago up to where we are today. So therefore, when things are discovered that are both ancient and also technologically advanced, this is suddenly a mystery. And so therefore, guess who gets the credit? Who gets the credit for all these things? Aliens, da-da, aliens, yeah. Aliens get the credit for doing all of the stuff because people couldn't have done these things because it's out-of-place artifacts. People couldn't have done it. So it's amazing to think. Now, now, all you have to do is do a comparison between the two theories to understand why these are considered out-of-place because if we've been evolving for two and a half million years, well, somehow, somehow you have, you know, we've come from, uh, a single cell like we looked at last night, then you come through the caveman stage and so forth, and eventually up to the point where we are today. To the point where it, 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 it becomes a mystery to them and they can't understand how this, how this all came about. But it's not a problem to the Christian viewpoint from the, from the, the biblical viewpoint, Bible's viewpoint, because this book claims that we were made, we were created in the image of God. Therefore, we are inventive, we are creative, we are ingenious, we are problem solvers. That's because we're made that way. We're made in the image of God. So it's not a surprise to us that we've been able to figure out things all the time ever since God put Adam on the planet. So <clears throat> this program is in two parts. The first part is just to show you some of this. The book at the back, uh, I, guess, I don't know if we have any more brilliant left or maybe there might be a couple. This will go into more detail about some of these things, but um, it, it, it's just designed to show how mankind was able to do some incredible things that defy our description of them today. But then the latter part of the program is designed to show the decline of a civilization as depicted in Romans 1, and it's a stair step, and you can clearly see it, and you can compare it with our own. So, so sort of to, to, to begin with, I, 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 I'm, am, I'm amazed when I look at something like, for example, glass. I look at glass and I say to myself, who was the first person to, to look at sand and say, I think if I melt that stuff, I can make clear sheets of, of something that'll you know, keep out wind and rain and whatever. I mean, who came up with this idea? How did people come up with the, the things that you and I just take for granted now? And one of the Ranger Mike videos tries to talk about the difference between apes and man. And there is, a, there is quite a huge chasm, even though, um, you know, we look similar. We have two forward-facing eyes, we have hands, we have, you know, thumbs and all that kind of stuff. And so it stands to reason that part of our DNA is going to be very similar. But we're very different from an ape or an ape-like creature. For example, I had monkeys in Africa. And I can guarantee you, they did not appreciate art and they did not appreciate music. If, if I showed my monkey a violin, the only thing he's interested in is, can I eat this thing or can I play with it? If I were to play, him, play music, to him it's just noise. If I show him a painting, again, all he's interested in doing is, is this a game? Is this, can, I can I play with this or can I eat it? That's all they're interested in. They, they know nothing. So how does an ape-like creature learn to write things down, learn a known language. How do you make that jump? So, for example, when you look in the past, you look at something like this. Where did music come from? 
an evolutionist would have to say that somehow something like this might have taken place. Like and as your ancestors are forming, they're kind of working their way through the caveman stage. And uh, how in the world you know, did, the, did an ape learn to appreciate music? So it's just a little drawing here of a stretched vine and uh, your ancestor accidentally tripped on it and it went boing, 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 boing. And of course, ooh, made funny sound, try again. Boing, 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 boing. And there's the origin of the guitar, you know. And, and how in the world did we go from the things that an ape can do to the many, many, many things that a human can do and appreciate even that an ape cannot do? So what we want to do is look at this from the perspective of origins. The vertical line you're seeing here represents the beginning of time, no matter what the view is. So let's look at the, uh, let's look at the evolution view, but the horizontal line is the passage of time. The evolution view says that everything began simple, primitive, a single cell that somehow with the passage of time got better and better and better. And what I mean by better and better, I mean more and more complex with the passage of time. The creation model is exactly the opposite. The creation model says, no, at the beginning, everything was good. Everything was perfect. You and I would have seen that perfect earth at the beginning. We would have said, wow, that's awesome. Now we use that word awesome to describe anything, ice cream, you know, carpet, pens, whatever. You know, what word do we have left to describe God? So we would have said, wow, this, <laughs> the early earth was awesome. It was amazing. It was beautiful. Everything was good at the beginning. The Bible simply says, God said it was good. God said it was very good. No, man, we would have responded a whole lot more. We would have said, wow, this is, a, this is absolutely phenomenal. But with the passage of time, we have been devolving ever since. All you need to do is look at language. Just read a Shakespeare play and then listen to language today. Just so we can see that language is even devolving. But what I'm I wanted to show you our, the, the, the biblical line is, is crooked, it's jagged. The reason I did that is because at the top, at the peak of every, of every jagged line there, the peak represents great civilizations of the past. Civilizations that we know about, we've been able to learn about them, we've been able to uncover enough stuff to say, wow, this was a great civilization in this country or in this region before. Look what they were able to accomplish. And always... At the peak of these civilizations, they were able to accomplish astounding things, not only militarily, but they, were, they invented incredible things, and they were able to, in society, they were just able to do amazing things at the peak of every great civilization that we've ever found. However, on the decline of every single civilization, every single one of them has exhibited immorality, um, violence, despotism, human sacrifice, and so forth. Every one of them exhibited the same traits on their way down. So what we want to look today, what we want to look at today is at the peak to begin with, and then we want to look at the decline, because the Bible actually defines it for us. So that, let's, start by looking, let's, let's start by looking at the, the, the words that the wisest man who ever lived penned. So Solomon said, the thing that hath been... That it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there's nothing new under the sun. What? Nothing new? Is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new. <laughs> it's been already of old time, which is before us. There's no remembrance of former things, neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that shall come after. What is Solomon saying? We're just doomed to kind of constantly repeat the, repeat the past. We're doomed to repeat history. Well, maybe, maybe that's part of what he's saying. But in, in the bitterness of his spirit, in Ecclesiastes, he's just observing these things and he's saying, ah, oh, like everything is futile. We just do the same things over and over and over again. Oh, is this something new? No, no, no. It was done long ago and just forgotten. Really? He might be opening up a little bit of a door for us here. Let's have a look. Let's open that door. We'll, do, we'll start easily. We'll start gently. And we'll just look at a few easy things to begin with. You're looking at the Grave Creek Stone found in 1938 in West Virginia, and when they discovered it, they thought it was car Indian carvings on a stone. Until they discovered it's not Indian at all, it's actually Phoenician. What were the Phoenicians doing in, <laughs> in West Virginia? Now we know 
that the Phoenicians were all down the coast of uh, the east coast of the Americas, all through the Gulf, all down the east coast of South America. In fact, fascinatingly, there's an artifact when we redo this program in uh, our, our DVD. We actually spent a little bit of time in Colorado uh, two weeks ago. I was, it was between two father-son retreats, and, and we spent some time in between going out to the western part of the state to look for a good place to film and uh, to film this one on ancient civilizations among some of the ancient ruins that are out there. There is a phenomenal thing. I won't take the time to, to, to go into the detail about it right now, but there's a phenomenal thing in not too far southwest of Albuquerque that has been discovered, and it's amazing. It's out in the middle of nowhere, and you have to get a permit to go to it, but it is called the Decalogue Stone. It is a stone at the base of a butte, at the top of the butte seems to be an old settlement that doesn't seem to match the uh, typical Hopi, early Hopi stuff that's all through the area. But carved on the stone is what's fascinating. The Ten Commandments in ancient Hebrew. Now think that one through for a moment. Who were the Phoenicians? Think about the fact that they were neighbors to King David and King Solomon. Who was their king? Hiram, king of Tyre. Who was he king of? The Phoenicians. They were the seafarers of old. They knew the oceans amazingly. What does the Bible say that Solomon did with Hiram's men? He sent them in their ships all around the world to go bring back treasures. Chances are this was one place they went, and since the Mosaic law said you have to have the Ten Commandments on your doorpost, this was very likely a temporary settlement, and they carved the Ten Commandments there because that was their home. Isn't that astounding to think of the possibility? Solomon's man, right from the Bible in modern, in modern day New Mexico. It's an amazing thing. So we're going to include that in the video, Lord willing. So we know the Phoenicians were all through here. Well, so were the ancient Celts. It's, you know, carvings in, in various caves, you know, were, they thought they were Indian as well. No, it turned out that they were all Celtic. What were the ancient Celts doing here? See, we're told that we're living in the day and age of travel. No, the ancients were, <laughs> were already apparently traveling, and we know that already. In a, a grave in Central America comes the carvings of people representing different racial groups, different racial ten, uh, uh, characteristics. Now think about it. At Babel, everybody pretty much looked the same. They all came from Noah. They were, they were all right there. But when God separated the people, as you saw on Sunday, as God separated the people, He's also isolating gene pools, which became the various racial characteristics of people we have today. And it would have happened very quickly. But already they're coming back together again. Already the ancients are traveling and making carvings of each other. There's your Phoenician. There's an African, a Chinese, a Mongol found in one, in one grave in Central America. Amazing. Carvings of people from different places around the world that are already showing different genetic traits. Well, if you look at the yellow portion, the special portion to the right, it's the Yucatan Peninsula. But in that peninsula, there are many structures like these. We call them pyramids. When you and I think of pyramids, we think of Egypt. And of course, that's where there's some amazing pyramids there. But these pyramids that you see in this region all have their own architectural flavor. They have their own uh, reflections of however they would have built them. But interestingly, most of the pyramids in this region have the same base dimensions of the pyramids in Egypt. Could they have had a common designer? And could that design possibly have been the one they were building at Babel? We don't know. It's just, it's a thought. It's just interesting to think, okay, so we, 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 don't, we don't know about the table of, Tower of Babel, but we do know what the pyramids are. We do know what these things are. And we do know that God spread the people throughout the face of the world. Could this be that engineers were among these groups who just took the plans in their heads for this tower? Maybe they're just building it like they saw back in Babel. I don't know. It's just interesting thoughts, right? So look behind those pyramids. What do you see? You see mountains, right? Those are not mountains. Those are all pyramids buried in the jungle. They say, and of course I don't know if this is true or not, but some people claim there are as many as 100,000 pyramids buried in the jungle. Even if that's off by a factor of 10, that still means there's maybe up to 10,000 pyramids buried in the jungle. It's just too expensive to dig them all out. 
What, what would you find in them? What would, what would be there? It's been, they've been buried long, long ago. In, ancient people were obviously traveling, and they know that. Just go a little bit to the south, and in Maya country, this program used to be called Whatever Happened to the Maya. In Maya country, they found some astounding things. They realized, before we look at what this thing actually represents or what they think it represents, they know that the Maya were accurately following the movements of the planets, like Venus. Now, here I am living in the 21st century. I'm not even so sure I could go out on a clear night and point out Venus to you. I might be able to point out Mars because of the kind of the reddish tint. They not only knew what Venus was, not, and they also, but they could accurately predict its every movement. That's astounding. They figured out that our year was 365.242 days. We now know that it's 365.2422 days. Why, those simple Maya, they were off eight seconds a year. <laughs> or were they? Back when they made those calculations, they might have been right on the money. The only way you can get that accurate today is with an atomic clock. How did they get that accurate back then? These ape-like creatures. <laughs> They're still evolving. We can't even figure out what they used. How did they get that accurate? So when this was discovered, this building, they found crystals in it. They didn't know what that meant. They didn't know what the crystals meant. So they asked the, the people who lived in the area, what was this tower? One of the stories, and of course there's no, nobody knows for sure, but one of the strange stories was that, the, our, the, that the, our ancestors used to be able to go up into this tower and communicate great distances. Did Marconi really discover radio waves, or did these people use the crystals like, like found in microphones and so forth today? Did they, did they know how to actually tap into radio waves long ago? And it was just forgotten, like Solomon says. I mean, there's no way to know. But the claim, one of the claims was they used to be able to go here and communicate grace distances. Is that hocus pocus or is it true? We don't know. Some friends of ours, when I was doing this program, they said, when we were in that area for our honeymoon, we, uh, this is up in Maine, and so they, they were saying, we, we just came back from the area. We were in that very building, and our guide took us around the corner into, in, into another different area where there was a large amphitheater. And our guide said, stand right here on this platform. And they, and they stood right there. They could see that it was all worn down for many years of use. And here's the amphitheater all in front of them. They said, look to your left and look to your right. What do you see? And they said, well, just big rocks. They said, yes, but in the day, those rocks were carved and highly polished so that the priest of the sun could stand right here on this platform, speak with his normal voice, and be clearly heard everywhere throughout the whole amphitheater. So now think about it. What's this thing hanging on my ears? <laughs> it's a microphone that has to go down here to a little transmitter, which has to go somewhere else to a receiver and then eventually gets transferred to speakers and it needs batteries, it needs electricity to be get plugged in and all that. It needs all this maintenance. That didn't. Maybe polish the stones every now and then, and here you have an automatic amplification system in a big, large outdoor amphitheater. Somehow they were able to figure out how to bounce sound waves so that everybody in a given area could hear clearly. Amazing that they could figure that out. So now you move to the south into Tijuanaco, a place down in Bolivia, up at the 13,000 foot level. This is a city that looks like it was built for a race of giants. Everything is very large in this place. And in fact, a lot of the stones were already removed years ago to make the government buildings in La Paz, but then they realized they're getting rid of a national treasure, so they stopped doing that. So now it's kind of a tourist thing. But the gateway is sitting on a, a slab of stone that it's estimated to weigh 100 tons. They found the quarry where they were mined from 60 miles away over the Andes Mountains. So they asked the locals, how in the world did your ancestors move 100 ton stones over the Andes Mountains to here? And people have tried to figure it out, but one group said, well, our ancestors used to be able to move things with the aid of sound. The aid of what? Sound. What does that mean? We don't know. That's just one of the stories. 
look, that could be all just hocus pocus and nonsense. Or could they have had a technology to move heavy things that we just don't know about today? Well, apparently so, because let's cross over the oceans and go to Baalbek, Lebanon. Here you will find the Earth's largest megalith. This thing is huge. In fact, they found another one now underneath it at a little bit of an angle. This thing is huge. Look at the dimensions of it. 14 feet by 16 feet by 66 feet. Conservative estimates say it weighs over 1,200 tons. There isn't, there isn't an engineer alive today that knows how you move a stone that large. There's a museum in Switzerland. I want, to start, I want to get permission to start using this. There's a museum in Switzerland that literally has made a model of this, and it shows how many modern cranes would need, be needed. And so they've literally put models of the cranes all around it. And it takes like 25 cranes, huge cranes, to lift this thing. How did the ancients move it? So somebody might say, well, who said they're moving it? Maybe they were carving it, you know, right where it was. Oh, no, they were moving it. How do we know that? Look, look, let me, let me see if I can, if my back will tolerate me turning here. Yeah, okay, look right there. Do you see those, those columns? Those are Roman columns for a temple that the Romans built. Here's one of the stories about how this all happened. This one, I mean, and there are many different stories. I have no idea which one is true. This one was rather intriguing, and it seemed like it might, it might have some merit because of who the Romans were. When the Romans conquered modern-day Palestine, they came to this area and found an ancient building that was already in ruins. But they saw something there which defied description and it still defies description today. You can't go there because Baalbek is an Islamic hotbed. And if you'd go there, you might be in some trouble. But um, that you can get pictures from people who do live there. And so, so that's kind of nice. In any event, so they moved into the area and saw something that defied description. They could see the, the, the apparent ruins of an old temple. But underneath the temple, making the floor of the temple, are three of these stones the same size already in position as the base of that temple. So they were moving them. It defies all known <laughs> laws of physics. How do you move a stone that big? So the Romans knew that was impossible. So they called up their engineers. And, they, and, and if you know anything about Rome... If you've been able to be in, in anywhere around the Mediterranean, we've been privileged to, to be there. The, many things that the Romans built are still there and still in use. When I was speaking in Lisbon, we were going underneath this big, you know, big series of arches, and, and our guide said, oh, by the way, this is still one of the major water conduits for the city of Lisbon. It was built by the Romans 2,000 years ago. It's still being used by the city today. There's still highways that are still used by people today. So the Roman engineers were no slouches. They knew what they were doing. So according to this one account, they came up and they said, this is impossible. You cannot move a stone that big. Today, it's still impossible. Nobody knows how to do it. The only way we could move a stone that size now would be to cut it up and move it with heavy hydraulic equipment. But how do you move it all in as one piece? Nobody knows. So apparently, according to this story, and this makes sense, they... They bulldozed, or they bulldozed, they removed the rubble around what was apparently an old temple, and they built their own on top of that to this god of the area. And they said, this, this must be a god who helped these people build this thing. So we'll try to appease this god. We'll worship this god, and maybe he'll help us, help us in our military campaigns. So what you're seeing there is what's left of, of apparently what the Romans built as their temple. And it's all that, that's all that's left, those, those columns that are there. Who, who moved the stone? How did they do it? What technology, like Solomon says, did they have? And now it's just forgotten. And we still have not attained to that kind of, that kind of knowledge. Let's Let's cross back over and have a look at something in China. Now, the Chinese have kept better records almost than anyone else. We know, for example, they knew 
how many dynasties there were. They knew all about the leaders of those dynasties, and they know about one dynasty, the Han dynasty. They also know that the lady who was the queen of that dynasty was called Lady Dai, D-H-A-I, Lady Dai. They know when she died. She died 100 years before Jesus Christ was born. She died over 2,100 years ago. They knew more or less where her grave was, and they came across it when they were digging air raid shelters against the Russians. <laughs> the Chinese and the Russians haven't always had the, the best of relationships. They were building air raid shelters. They came across her tomb, and they thought, well, now's a good time to exhume her bodies. They pulled it out. They opened up the casket. They found another one inside, pulled it out, opened up another one, a little bit like those Russian dolls you keep opening, whatever. They came down to her body, and received two big shocks. The first one is what you're seeing in front of you because they found that her body was wrapped in silk. Now, silk was not the surprise because everybody had known up to that point about the silk trade that had been used for many, many years, the silk trade from China coming over to Europe. But what was surprising to them was that it was apparently printed in repeating patterns on top of the silk. Your history books will say Hans Gutenberg, Hans Gutenberg invented the printing press in what, 1451? He invented a single color printing press. I've seen it in Mainz, Germany, or the, or the, the model of it at the, at the museum. It's a very clever press. It's very clever the way he did it. But it was a monocolor press. What would Solomon whisper in Hans Gutenberg's ear? Hans, very cool printing press you made here. By the way, the Chinese have already invented one and they can make one in multiple colors. Nobody's ever found the Chinese printing press, but that's the first shock. Printed in, in, in repeat patterns. The second big shock came when they unclothed her body. They pulled the silk off of her body and then found her body. The machine that you're looking at, that they're using here, is actually able to see into her body. They found her skin was still supple, her hair was still firmly rooted in her scalp, and that machine could still see her last meal in her stomach and in her intestines. She died 100 years before Jesus Christ was born. There isn't an undertaker alive today that knows how to preserve a body that long. If you want to see her, go to Shanghai. They have it in the Natural History Museum there. Her body is in sealed glass, you can read the whole story. It's astounding. Who in the world knew how to preserve a body that long? Let's go back across the miles or back over to the Mediterranean and look at the Piri Rice map. This looks like an old map. I mean, it just, it just it sort of exudes that sort of ancient look. But look closely at it. This one is drawn on a deer skin. It was drawn in 1513 by Admiral Peary Rice. He was copying his map from older maps. He had some older copies, older maps, and he was making his own. This one is the only one that's remained. This is the one he drew in 1513. It's in a museum right now in Istanbul, Turkey. It's drawn on deer skin. And you, you say, okay, well, it looks like an old map. Yes, but it shows a couple things that are interesting. First of all, it shows that the oceans were higher, I'm sorry, lower at one point. If you were here on Sunday, you would have seen that. Right after the flood, the oceans were lower at one point. As the continent slowly sank and as the one ice age that developed at the beginning of the flood, the end of the flood and the beginning of the time after the flood, as it reached its zenith and began to melt back, it began to add water to the oceans. As the continent sank and as the water melted back, the oceans rose, burying some islands and burying some, some certain land. This shows the oceans still in a lowered state. What? It also shows the accurate coastline of Antarctica. Now, we did not discover that until the 1950s. Because if you look at Antarctica, it appears that you're looking at land, but you're not. In some cases, you're looking at ice flows that go way out into the ocean. So we only discovered in the 1950s where the actual coastline goes. This map apparently showed the accurate coastline. How did they know it? How did they find that out? So one group went to, went to work on it, and they, tried, they, they said, okay, well, we have to find out where the meridian runs. They found out that the meridian runs through Alexandria. They said, oh, this must be an ancient Greek map. 
But when they looked at the symbols used in this map, they realized this predates the Greek. The Greeks did not, did not use these symbols. So who drew the map and how did it get that accurate that they even could chart Antarctica? Oh, wow. Was it the Phoenicians after all? Who knows? Let's cross over the Mediterranean and look at one of the great civilizations of the past. And of course, when you think of Egypt, you think of the Sphinx and the pyramids and so forth. And those are very, very cool things to see. But there are many, many other cool things to see in Egypt. For example, you can go out in the middle of the desert and find tens of thousands of fossilized trees in the middle of the desert where nobody goes. Hmm, I wonder how that would have happened. But if you go up the river, up river to an ancient town called Abydos, there you'll find a temple, and in some of the supports of the temple are very strange carvings. Have a look at what some of these carvings are. Now, as you look at this, what do you think this thing looks like? <laughs> Helicopter, right? What do you think this thing looks like? Yeah, what about that? What about this thing? Doesn't that look like something from the Jetsons? You know, daughter, Judy, remember that? Okay. I have no idea what those things are. They could have been the musings of a genius like Leonardo da Vinci. Have you ever seen his kind of futuristic machines? Just th things he concocted in his mind. Who kn I don't know what those things are, but you should see what people have, how people have interpreted it. There are some quote-unquote Christian websites that say, oh, see, this, per this proves that ancient Egypt, they, they, they used helicopter air service. I'm like, okay, <laughs> okay whatever. You should see the, what the cults do with this. They have looked at what appears, it, it, look below the, what looks like a helicopter. Look at those markings there. Oh, people have interpreted this now. Yes, the aliens are coming for us on a specific year at a specific place. So if we're there on this certain time, we'll get beamed up to the spaceships. I mean, it is really wacko what people, how people have interpreted this. I have no idea what it is. I have no idea what it's supposed to represent. I just find it fascinating. We don't know what that is, but we know what this thing is. This was called the wooden bird, and it was found in an Egyptian tomb in 1898. Now, remember the date, 1898. It was found in an Egyptian tomb, but it didn't seem to fit anything. They're looking for pottery and all the things that they understood the Egyptians to use. This thing didn't seem to fit anything, so they put it back in a, in the, in a back room of the museum. Now the decades pass. Now it's the early 1940s. What's going on worldwide in the early 1940s? World War II. Now we've got fast fighter planes and giant bombers and all this kind of stuff. They pulled this thing out from this back room and they said, when was this discovered? 1898, before the Wright brothers flew. So some people, and they still do it today, they do drawings of this thing. Some people literally made exact models of it and some people even put power to it. And guess what? It flies. Now, nobody is saying that Egypt air was in existence back then. But this might have been something that people threw back and forth a little bit like you and I throw a Frisbee. They might have just made this thing and threw it back and forth so they at least knew about the wing shape and how it created lift. So you could say to the Wright brothers, cool machine, you made one with power, but they were already making, you know, airplanes or things that could fly just by pushing them forward in the air. Amazing stuff. We could go on and on and talk about the amazing oop arts found all around the world. To me, though, these things just indicate exactly what the Bible has said all along, that God made man in His image, and that means that mankind has been inventive, creative, ingenious. We've done astounding things. If you look even at what some of the ancient Peruvians could do, that stuff is astounding. There's a man by the name of Dr. Dennis Swift I've had the privilege of talking with him only one time on the phone, and he's invited me to Oregon to look at some of the stuff that they've discovered. Astounding things that the ancient Peruvians could do that'll just blow you away. Operations they could perform, even Ica stones that literally looked like they were instruction stones on how to do heart surgery and even possibly heart transplants. 
astounding things. Even the conquistadors, when they came, they noticed that the doctors, the Peruvian doctors were using for their scalpels, they were using um, cut um, obsidian. Obsidian makes a much, much sharper and cleaner cut than any scalpel that we have in the operating theaters today. They were already using angled, sharpened, cut obsidian, which makes very clean cuts with almost no blood coming out. It's astounding what they were able to do. And so they demanded that the doctors show them what their techniques were because they were doing these amazing operations and curing things, doing amazing stuff. But the Peruvian doctors refused to tell them, so they killed them. And so that's, you know, that's, that's, what their, that's their whole idea. But anyway, astounding things that the ancient Peruvians could do. Well, we could go on and on talking about it, but I think you get the point. Mankind made in the image of God could do amazing things. So now, let's look at the peak of the civilization. According to Romans 1.20, Romans 1.20 you know, talks about the evidence of God's existence just through what he made so that man's without excuse. But now verse 21 starts off by saying, and this is like the peak of the, of the, peak of the civilization, when they knew God. Can it get any better than that, folks? Knowing God. Knowing your Creator. The very person who not only made us but made everything in the universe that just totally fascinates us. All the scientific disciplines that there are, that just, you, see, you read about them in the paper and see them, see them in the magazines, and we go, wow, look at the stuff we're discovering. All the stuff God made. Can it get any better for humans than to know God? I don't think so. That's like the top step when they knew God. But the verse continues, though, unfortunately. When they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful. That seems like just a simple thing, but it is a step down, according to Romans 1, 21 and following. It seems like it's innocent enough, not, not, not being thankful for everything, not putting God in His rightful place, not worshiping Him as He is to be worshipped, as He wants us to worship. But it is the first step down. But then it continues but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Now we're going down to the next step, because now we're starting to walk away from God. Folks, let me make a point here right now, if you don't remember anything else. If you walk away from God, you will replace Him with something. And that something will always, always, without fail, prove to be futile and foolish. Always. So, when you think about this, they're walking away. Futility, confusion, foolishness. Could we list among these things the theory of evolution? God makes it clear in verse 20 that, look, the evidence for design is everywhere. If you can't see it, there's no excuse. How could you be so blind as to not see evidence of design everywhere? But the moment we say, no, no, God didn't do that, it did it itself. It happened on its own. Think about this. If you have trouble believing that, there's, that God made everything from nothing, Consider that your only alternative is to believe that nothing turned itself into everything. That's your only alternative. So the whole point is, we're now going to replace God with something foolish. In our modern society, that could be, you know, something like teaching evolution. Something so foolish as to think that all this complexity could come about by its, by its own, by random chance. But there have been other foolish ideas that mankind has had, of course. This just happens to be one thing in our society. And they exchange the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Now we've walked away from God, but we know inherently we know we've got to worship something. We know there's something that we need to honor. And so what we've done is we've turned to the, to the earth. Oh, earth first and animal rights and everything. You know, it, it, the creation has to have first place. The, of course, they don't look at it as a creation. But so, so, so now we're, we're going to create our own false things to worship. 
Folks, I don't know about you, but I, this whole idea of idolatry is not just limited to this book when we read about the idolatry that the Israelites took part in. When you read this book, you can see the Israelites carved images, just like the nations around them. They carved images. They, they could not see their gods because they were non-existent, of course, but they carved gods to represent what they wanted to believe, gods of fertility and gods of forests and whatever. So they carved, and they would worship an image of the god. That's why God told the Israelites, do not make a carved image. You never saw me. I am not to be worshiped in that way. You worship me in this way, not in the way the pagans do. Do not make a carved image. Do not worship me in that way. Well, I'm not, you're, you do not worship an image of me. But here is what is so cool about the New Testament. The Bible refers to Jesus as being the image of God. That's why Jesus Christ is somebody who we can freely worship because he is the image of the invisible God. But back then, this idolatry was just overtaking the Israelite people. Now, the New Testament idol equates idolatry with greed. Idolatry takes many different forms. An, an idol can be anything in our lives that takes God's rightful place. And that can be anything. It could even be good things. If it takes God's rightful place in our lives, if it supplants Him, then it can become an idol. Now, in many parts of the world, idolatry takes a very, very practical form because many people do not have, even barely have the necessities of life. Let me just tell you something about South Africa, where I grew up. So, in the seaport city of Durban, where I did my high schooling, where my wife and I were missionaries teaching at Durban Bible College. It's where my father is buried. The seaport city of Durban has a high concentration of Indians from India. It all has to do with the history of the nation and the sugarcane industry and all of that. But there's a high concentration of Indians there. So they brought with them Hinduism. At the college where we worked, most of the students were Indian and they were former Hindus. I have to tell you, Hinduism is the scariest religion I have ever been around. Over here, we've adopted several things with Hinduism, like yoga is a very, very distinct Hindu practice, and it is extremely dangerous. We've seen it firsthand, but I, I, that's, a, that's another topic. But So when I was a teenager, we were invited to the initiation of a Hindu priest, I had no idea what this was all about. We gathered on, a, in a, on, a, on a, one afternoon at a huge soccer ball field, soccer field, several fields for that matter. There was a big concrete pad with a monster fire burning on it. The fire was so hot you couldn't get anywhere near it. So all this, thousands of Indians were gathering around. We were some of the very few white people even there. But we were standing there watching, and then they came with these long poles and bashed down the fire. So the white hot coals were like a foot to a foot and a half thick. Here came the high priest to this one end of this concrete pad, and he, he, he stopped the cart there. They stopped the cart, and on the cart was a bunch of flowers, and in the middle of the flowers was a plastic doll representing the millions of gods that Hindus worship. They worship millions of gods. They'll just add Jesus, just hopefully, you know, hopefully he'll, he'll see them through, whatever. So here came the new young guy who was going to be the new initiate for, to the priesthood. They brought him in front of us right next to the fire. Well, I mean, the fire was still, it's just too hot to get near it. They brought him right past us. They had to guide him because he couldn't see anymore. His eyes were rolled up in his head. He was foaming at the mouth. He was, had no clothes on except his shorts, and he was pulling a steel cart with all kinds of body parts of animals and stuff on it. He was pulling the cart with wire connected to fish hooks, which were all hooked through his back. So he was pulling the cart with fish hooks, and he pulled it past us, and I thought, what in the world is this? So what they did is they brought him around to the far side of this concrete pad with this big fire. Now he's facing the high priest on the other side. And I, 
I still, I still didn't get what they were doing. Suddenly I noticed them getting pails, buckets. And at the far end of the concrete was a trough and they began to fill the trough with milk because a cow is considered a sacred animal in the Hindu religion. I suddenly realized, no, 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 no. I've seen people die. I don't want to watch a guy, another person die right in front of me. But at the signal from the high priest, this young man, barefoot, nothing on except his shorts, pulled that steel cart. He walked into the fire, through that whole thing, walked through the fire, and at the end, he stepped into the milk and back out of the milk, and he wasn't even burned. He should have died screaming in pain within 10 seconds of entering that heat, entering the fire. What would you have thought had you seen that? I know what I thought. I was scared. Because I knew I was seeing active demonic presence right in front of me. My first impulse as a teenager was to think to, it was to pray and say, Lord, why? Why did you allow that? It's the same prayer I would have prayed had I seen in front of Pharaoh when Aaron threw down his rod and it became a snake. Do you remember what the Bible says? His magicians did the same thing with their secret arts. And I would have said, I would have said then to, Lord, why? I, I, how could they do that? How could they, how could they make their sticks into snakes? Somehow the Lord is allowing the devil to do this. I don't know how or why or what he's trying to do in a situation like that. But I know, I knew then I was scared. I also knew that I had seen the impossible. I had seen a miracle. Furthermore, I knew that all those Indians around us had seen the same thing. Now they are locked and loaded. They knew that they had seen the impossible, and so they're going to obey that guy no matter what he says. Because now they're going to say, man, he should have died. <laughs> he, should have, he should have never made it out of that fire. So obviously the gods are with him. So whatever he says, we'll do. God, the gods are with him. How do you overcome that kind of power when you're witnessing to people? Can you see why it's so important to pray for your missionaries? And by the way, the demons that were active right in front of my eyes, there's just as much demonic activity over here. It just doesn't need to be so overt. Over there, the people barely have food, barely have enough to sustain themselves, hardly have enough clothing. So the devil keeps them enslaved through fear. The Zulu people that I grew up with all told me about the tokolosh. What's the tokolosh? They would talk about seeing the little red eyes running through the forest. And when I talk with my dad and the other missionaries, they said, no, they are seeing demons. They are really seeing demons. They just call it the tokolosh, like you and I would call it a troll or something like that. This stuff is absolutely real. But over here, we have so many other things to keep our minds off of God, to keep our eyes off of God. Over there, they've got nothing. So they use real, the devil uses real demonic manifestations to keep the people locked in fear. Over here, the devil's like, no, just, let's just stay back, let's just stay back. The Americans have stuff, we've got everything, we've got money, we've got everything, we've got everything over here. Oh, and we'll throw in evolution to just keep their eyes, oh yeah, God didn't make us. But the demons are absolutely just as active here. It's just not so overt. The people who would try to witness to those Hindu people, can you imagine the uphill battle? I can guarantee you that every one of those Hindu people who saw that activity that day live in absolute fear and horror every night. Every one of them. And when they got witness to when a Christian would come and say, Jesus can free you from the fear, free you from your sin, free you from all of that. Their question back is, well, I saw the impossible. I saw something that shouldn't have happened. What's your Jesus going to do for me, hmm? And the only answer is, he can free you from your sin. He can free you from the fear. These things are demonic. Some believe, most don't. And they die in absolute horror and fear.
That's Hinduism. Well, let's move on. The verse continues, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness, to the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Now we've moved on down the line. Now we're talking about immorality. Let furthermore, it says, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is forever, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did exchange the natural use for that which is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which is fitting. That's the next step down. That's now to down to depravity. And by the way, you know exactly what is being referred to there. In our society, we're not only supposed to accept it, but we're supposed to laud it as something honorable. Then it continues. <laughs> and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, get rid of that manger scene from the town square. We don't want to have any reminder of this creator of ours. God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not seemly. Now here comes the final list. It gets kind of exhausting to read it, but I'll breathe through it here quickly. To do those things which are not seemly, being filled with, here we go, all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, insolent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that, they commit, that those who commit such things are worthy of death... <laughs> not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. What would you call this final list? On our stairway, I simply call this total societal chaos. Now, in your own mind, don't say anything out loud, but in your own mind, answer this question. Where do you think the United States is on that stairway? Yeah, exactly. It doesn't take much to figure it out. Who would have ever, ever dreamed 10 years ago that people wouldn't even know what gender they are? I mean, it, it's, it's astounding how, how the devil in these last days is trying to do everything he can to deceive people and keep them completely confused about things. I mean, it used to be that, okay, we knew at least, you know, what gender we were. We kind of knew right from wrong. Now the lines are blurred, even just things common things are just so blurred that how do you get, how do you find your way back even to the starting point? So they say, whoever they is, <laughs> whoever they are, that no great civilization lasts longer than about 200 years. If that's the case, boy, we're really on borrowed time. Folks, let me wrap this up by simply saying this. If you read all throughout the Scriptures, the scriptures are, of course, about, you know, mainly about the Hebrew, the Hebrew nation and Jesus and, and so forth. That's what the scriptures are mainly about, the prophets and all of that. And you can read the ups and downs of the Hebrew people all through, especially the Old Testament, kind of culminating in the New Testament on a real down part. But then, of course, Jesus arriving on the scene was a very good thing. But we can see all throughout time of the Hebrew people. They would walk in the light and go into darkness. They'd walk in the light, and you know, God would bring them out of the darkness, and they'd start in the light, and they'd go down. That is what the book of Judges is all about. They would, God would free them. There'd be, let's just say, like a mini revival, if you, would, if, if you would, under a certain judge. And the nation would be fine. And then that judge would die. What would the people do? They'd go right back to their idolatry, go right back into the darkness. And what was the overriding statement? What is the overriding statement in the book of Judges that kind of characterized their, their thinking? Every man did what? What was right in their own eyes. What kind of life did that get them? Did that get them the kind of life they wanted? No, it got them poverty, fear. It got them shame. It got them everything they didn't want. Slavery. And yet they refused to follow the Lord. So you can read all about that. All throughout, all throughout the all throughout history. Think about Solomon when he built the temple. 
when he built this amazing building, what did he in essence say to God in his prayer? Oh God, we are your people, you are our God, we've made this great building for your great name. In essence, what does God say in response? He says, all right, you've made this wonderful building, my name will dwell there, I will, you know, you, I will be your God, you will be my people, but it's going to be on my terms. If you ever do not follow, if you ever walk away from me and do not follow my word anymore, I will come and make this place so desolate that anyone who comes by here is going to gasp and they'll say, what happened to this once great beautiful land? What happened to this great beautiful temple? And the answer will be, they abandoned the God of their fathers. They abandoned the God of the book. Folks, did that happen? It happened. And Israel became a wasteland. In fact, it pretty much still is. It's nothing like the the beauty that it used to have. It's recovering somewhat now, but since 1948, but it's, it's, it's nothing like it used to be. What God predicted is exactly what happened. So when you read in, in the book of Judges, the very beginning of the book of Judges, so now it comes right after Joshua. Jo- under Joshua, they've had this phenomenal military campaign. They've seen their faith vindicated right in front of them on all their campaigns. Then what is, then by the time you get to the book of Judges, Judges chapter 2, it says, And Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. And then they buried him in his hometown. Then it says, incredible, it says, After that whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. What? Those people saw nothing worthy to pass down. All of the incredible miracles to get them out of Egypt, all the incredible miracles to keep them alive in the desert. I mean, their shoes never wore out. They never had to worry about not having fruits or vegetables. They had manna to eat. You know, you get bitten by a snake, you just look at a pole and you're healed. I mean, miracle after miracle. The sea parts in front of them, they walk across, miracle after miracle. They saw nothing worthy to pass down? I'm sorry, I don't understand that. But here... Here's the point that I want to make. These people in this word and all the people we've looked at in history, they all had their time to be alive. God gave them life in their time, and they either did something with their life or they didn't. So many people had a legacy. (laughs) But they are all gone. Their opportunities are all gone. Here's the point, though. You and I have the earth now. You and I are alive now. You and I have the opportunities now. What are we doing with our lives? Are we living them just for ourselves? Or are we here for a purpose? What awards are we going to be given? What what will our life accomplish We could say, whatever happened to the Maya people? I don't know. Whatever happened to the Jews? I don't know, but the book certainly gives us an awful lot of what happened to them. But let's forget all that. A lot of that has been history. But here's the challenge for us today. We are alive now. What are we doing with our lives? When we reach, when you reach the end of your life, whenever that's going to be, and that silver cord, as the Bible called, that silver cord is separated and you die. Will it have made any difference that you ever lived? Heavenly Father, thank you for the, your word. It, is, it has so many fascinating and practical things for us. We can see the failures of the past in people who should have known better. How in the world did Balaam not see what he was doing? How in the world did David and some of the great people, how in the world did some of them make the mistakes they did? Well, we make mistakes too, Lord. But like David, he, he owned up to his sin and he, he repented and moved forward. And he left a great legacy, a great name. Father, we have the earth today. You, we are so privileged to enjoy this planet now. Of all of the billions of people who have lived before us, we are privileged to have the earth now. Lord, please impress upon our lives the need to 
to do something with our lives, to honor you, to represent your kingdom on this planet. Because you've given us all incredible gifts and abilities. I pray that we would be able to use them for your honor and glory and that we would will to do that. So I just commit these people here. Thank you so much for them being here. I pray that this will have meaning to all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Brother Mike. I just want to give you uh, a thought quickly as, as this is his last night with us. There were two different situations um, a little ways apart. In Jeremiah chapter 18, many of you are familiar with this, when Jeremiah went down and he saw the, the potter's house, remember? And God, God showed him how the potter could smash the clay and make it into something different. And, and God's point was that if a nation turned its back on God, God could take away the blessings that he gave them. But if they turned back to God, God could give them back. And it's interesting, the reaction of the people. This is what they said in response to Jeremiah's message. It's Jeremiah 18, verse 12. And they said, that is hopeless. How many times have you maybe even heard Christian people say, well, we're too far gone? That was the lie that Jeremiah's generation was saying when Jeremiah told them, turn back to God. Sometimes he says that to us as individuals, doesn't he? You've gone too far. You've gone the wrong direction. And so Jeremiah's generation said this. They said, that is hopeless. So we will walk according to our own plans, and we will, everyone, obey the dictates of his evil heart. They basically used the fact that God would, would not be forgiving as an excuse to go on in their sin. I'll take you to a different account in Jonah chapter 4. You remember when Jonah was sent to the Ninevites? What was his message? Repent or else? How long? 40 days. And if you don't repent, God's going to destroy this nation. They were 40 days away from destruction. And if you remember, the people did repent and God showed mercy. And it made Jonah angry. And listen to what Jonah said. He said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore, I fled previously to Tarsus, for I knew that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness. The word loving kindness is the idea of steadfast love. One who relents from doing harm. Jonah said, God, I knew you'd show him mercy. I knew you would show him mercy. May I just say to you that God would rather show us mercy than judge us, and that has not changed. And we need to make up our minds, you know what? I need to turn from my evil ways. I don't have to be part of that collapse of society. And to be honest with you, God could change all of that because that's the kind of God we serve. I hope you'll think about that. But it starts on you and me as an individual, what we decide to do with what God has to say. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this challenging um, uh, talk tonight from Mike. We thank you. Lord, we see the glories of past civilizations, and I know he would say he just touched on the highlights of just a few civilizations across the world. Lord, your stamp, the image of God, is on man, and although we've marred it horrifically, Lord, we see that all across the world. But Lord, we also know that we can't change the past. As Mike was challenging us right at the end, we only have this generation in which we live. And Lord, may we not believe the lie that Jeremiah's people believed, and that is it's hopeless, there's no sense in even trying to change, no sense in even trying to repent. We'll just go on the way we've been living and take our chances. And Lord, how foolish that was. Those people were judged horrifically. And yet, Lord, here was a pagan society, a society that was very violent, very wicked, the Assyrian society. Um, Lord, had done great damage, had, had done horrific atrocities. And you had said to them, they were 40 days away from destruction, and yet you worked to send one man, a man didn't even want to go, a man didn't even love the people, but you sent him there so that you could forgive those people and show mercy. Lord, that shows us your heart. And I pray for any who may be here tonight, and the truth is they think they've gone too far. Lord, if they're able to hear this message, if they're able to think and and have a chance to repent. They have that chance, Lord. May they take advantage of it. 
And Lord, we pray for our country, for our civilization. We know that we have turned our back on Thee. We know that that we have seen uh, horrific things in our own society, things we would never imagined. The, just the amount of innocent lives that have been murdered in the last uh, 50 years is astounding. And yet, Lord, we are grateful that we serve a God who does want to show us mercy. May we agree with what Jonah saw, and that is that is your character, that you want to show mercy to repentant people. May we be that people. And Lord, we pray you to help us to think on these things. We just rejoice that the Snavelys could be with us this week. Give us safety as we go to our homes. May you accomplish in our lives what you wanted to through this time together, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for coming. Lord bless you. Have a great night.